Fellows and guests, thank you all very much for coming. It's lovely to see so many of you here this afternoon. It's been remarked on numerous occasions that the Society is rather strong on anniversaries. We celebrated both the, both the centenary and the bicentenary of our Royal Charter in 1851 and 1951, respectively. And more recently, in 2007, of course, we commemorated the tercentenary of that first meeting of the Antiquaries at the Bear Tavern in the Strand. Now, 2017 is no less important, seeing as it does the tercentenary of the revival of the Society in 1717, when the first of the continuous set of records of the Society was made by William Stukeley, records, of course, which are still in the Society's possession, and incidentally, now recognised to be of such importance that we believe they could eventually be a suitable candidate for the UNESCO Memory of the World Register. As a result, I thought this would be an appropriate moment to celebrate yet another anniversary, more modest perhaps, but nonetheless important, and reflect on what's happened during the 10 years since our tercentenary celebrations, which marked a significant moment in the Society's history, quite a turning point. So what I'm going to do is start by looking at the Society in 2007, then consider the ways in which we've changed since that time and how those changes have been achieved, and then finally think about our plans moving forward for the next 10 years. So what was going on in the Society in 2007? We were a smaller society then, fellows numbered 2,500, and there was an aspiration now met to increase this number to 3,000 by the end of the decade. The Society's commitment to fostering knowledge and understanding of the past through research grants, publications, library services and museum collections was fundamental to all our activities, as it had been for the previous 300 years. But evident was a growing realisation that there was a need for us to extend our knowledge, resources and services to a wider audience if we were satisfactorily to fulfil our charitable purpose and deliver public benefit. 2007 saw the first contested election since 1959. That was the year that Joan Evans and Ian Richmond both stood as president. And Jeff Wainwright was elected our 41st president. The deaths of both Jeff and Di, and Di Morgan Evans this March has been a particularly sad and difficult time for the society. Both Jeff and Di loved the society and in their different ways made a tremendous contribution to life here at Burlington House and they will be sadly missed. We will be celebrating both their lives at separate memorials events to be held here later in the year to which all fellows will be welcome. In Jeff's 2007 election manifesto, he stated his intention that we should use our tercentenary to secure the society's future. The start of a new era was heralded by the refurbishment of the ground floor public areas at Burlington House, before on the left and after on the right. Uh, with support from major grants, rooms were restored, pictures rehung, and just as importantly, the opportunity was taken to install state-of-the-art audiovisual equipment, allowing lectures to be recorded for the first time. I think you can see the earlier equipment in the middle there at the bottom left. Um, this was an important first step towards engaging a wider audience. This intention, indeed, informed all the arrangements for the tercentenary, which followed a year of planning under uh, uh, Jeff Wainwright's uh, predecessor as president, Eric Fernie. There was a clear ambition that as many members of the public as possible should attend lectures and events, and fellows were encouraged to do all they could to make this happen. This drive for greater public engagement was a significant development, particularly given that at that time, this far from welcoming notice sat firmly across the steps of Burlington House, only to be removed in 2010 with the arrival of our current General Secretary. The Tercentenary Programme was launched in September 2007 and publicised over the course of the year in a run of no less than 12 issues of Fellowship News. And it's been fascinating reading. The big showpiece, of course, was the of the Tercentenary was, of course, the Making History exhibition, the first to be held by the Society 
since the exhibition to celebrate the bicentenary in 1951. The 1951 exhibition had been small scale and held in the society's rooms, mainly just across the, the hall there. But the ambitious scale of the 2007 exhibition led to its being held in the Royal Academy's main galleries. The exhibition colour catalogue, together with the Visions of Antiquity volume, also published in 2007, represent an important legacy of the tercentenary, as was the recognition that fellows pulling together can achieve great things. Fellowship News records that, above all, making history has been a team effort. It would simply not have been possible to put on an exhibition of this scale without the help of so many fellows. While the exhibition itself was deemed a success, there was a significant downside, as unfortunately it resulted in a substantial financial loss due partly to inadequate sponsorship and an insufficient number of paying visitors. We've learned from this experience and, as I shall show later, now aim to hold more frequent but smaller scale exhibitions and only when all funding is secured in advance. At Kelmscott, things were going rather less well than at Burlington House. The worst flood for 50 years hit the village in July. The house had to close the remainder of the season for repairs and conservation work, and considerable misgivings were being expressed within the fellowship as to why the society was burdening itself with the effort and expense of running a country estate. We've come a long way in addressing that particular issue, a topic to which I shall return later. So what's happened since? How did the events of the tercentenary year change us, in particular the efforts to improve our public benefit and reach a wider audience? An early success in achieving this was the award of a Heritage Lottery Fund grant, which allowed making history to tour to four UK regional museums from late 2008 to early 2010. And this was followed in late 2011 by the first ever trip of the Society's collections to America, enabled by partnership with Boston and Yale universities. When the exhibits finally turned to, returned to Burlington House in 2012, over 200,000 people had seen them in the UK and the US. Public access to the Society's collections on a scale never achieved before. Public interest in the Society and its collections was thus becoming very clear. And under the, and under the presidency of my predecessor, Morris Howard, Council began to debate how this might be encouraged further. Mounting more exhibitions was an obvious initial step, as long as they could be made to pay for themselves. And 2014 saw nearly 3,000 visitors coming to the first exhibition in our rooms since the 1951 Bicentenary Exhibition. Portraying the past was a tentative first step and a very successful one emboldening us to be far more ambitious in 2015 with the Magna Carta exhibition, bottom right. That event attracted over 14,000 visitors to Burlington House and included activities, events, and an accompanying public lecture series organised by fellows. At Kelmscott, we also launched a programme of exhibitions. In 2012, a collection of Burne Jones drawings lent by the V&A, and in 2014, bottom left, an exhibition marking the centenary of Jane Morris's death, mounted in partnership with the National Portrait Gallery. Prior to 2007, the principal way in which we had made our collections publicly accessible was through loans. If anything, this strand of our activities increased after the Making History exhibition, when the extent and importance of our collections became more widely appreciated. Over the course of the last 10 years, we've made loans to a number of important and prestigious exhibitions, including the uh, 2009 Henry VIII Queen Centenary Exhibition at the British Library, bottom right, uh, the loan of the blue silk dress from Kelmscott to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and William Morris's bed to Tate Britain. Our loans and exhibition programme has had the additional benefit of promoting the conservation of our collections. We used to pay for conservation as the need arose and as we could afford it. 
Nowadays, major pieces of conservation are frequently initiated by exhibitions or projects and are paid for by external funding. Conservation of two of our copies of Magna Carta, for example, was undertaken prior to the 2015 exhibition, thanks to a grant from the Bank of America, and a number of our pictures were conserved prior to their inclusion in the picture catalogue, published in 2015, due to the generosity of fellows. Our ability to extract external funding has been considerably enhanced by establishing a development office with a permanent fundraiser. An initial appointment was made in 2009, and funding for the first five years was supported by a generous bequest from our fellow Raymond Connolly. Recognition of the Society's high standards in the management of its collections at both Kelmscott and Burlington House was achieved in late 2009 with the award of full accredited museum status by the Arts Council. This was a significant achievement on which our collection staff, Heather Rowlands and Anushka Rawdon, uh, and are to be congratulated. Anushka, of course, has now left the Society and to join the uh, Science Museum Group. Accreditation means that the Society has demonstrated its commitment to effective collections care, good governance, and the development of visitor and user services. And we successfully renewed it in 2014, and it will be up for renewal again later this year. In 2007, so exhibition and loans were seen as the principal means of introducing our collections to new audiences and promoting knowledge of the past. Since then, we've continued with those programmes, as I've just shown, but there have been significant developments in the way these are delivered, which has moved beyond simply telling people about the past to offering more opportunities for people to engage with the past. We've been approaching this in a number of different ways. At Kelmscott, family workshops and children's trails have been introduced, and a successful artist-in-residence season, bottom right, was held in 2014. During the Magna Carta exhibition, activities were offered to extend its appeal beyond the traditional museum goer, including workshops and events for school groups and families, and a late evening with medieval music. We will see that medieval musician a bit later on as well. Look out for him. The latter was such a success that it inspired a series of three summer late evenings at Burlington House in summer 2016, which explored the history of the society. They were wonderful evenings. If you didn't attend them, you missed out on, some, on quite a treat. And the interactive timeline which is produced to support that is on the website. And if you haven't looked, do. It's well worth, uh, it's well worth exploring. The first two evenings included dramatic interludes, one of which was a reenactment of an early meeting of the society. I have to say that this fellow in the middle made me feel quite inadequate. Um, and it was hugely enjoyed by guests and fellows alike. Uh, related objects from our collections were on display with the opportunity to discuss them with fellows. At the third event, celebrating the society today, there was the chance to discuss the results of current research projects, including a number which have been supported by society grants. Visitors very clearly appreciated the opportunity to learn more about the society and our collections through talking to fellows who attended. And the nice thing was that fellows also said how much they had enjoyed the opportunity to share their own knowledge and enthusiasm for the past with people who came to the evenings. So a win-win situation. Other initiatives to promote public engagement at Burlington House have included the introduction of our public lecture series in 2012, which has proved immensely popular. Numbers attending have now more than doubled since they were first introduced and lectures are nearly always fully booked. We've also been engaging with school groups and young scholars, and since 2013, internships have been offered to students at both Burlington House and Cairnscott Manor, and two postgraduate days have been held in the library, with another planned for later this year. Again, the opportunity at all these events to benefit from the knowledge and expertise of fellows has been an important part of the experience. The increased use of technology over the period has revolutionized the ways in which we can reach our potential audiences. Recording of lectures, both the fellows and public series, 
began in 2012 with that audiovisual equipment which was uh, installed at the beginning of the tercentenary. And there is now a remarkable online lecture archive available. Features such as unlocking our collections and on this day are highlighting our collections to a much wider audience. And in addition to website and salon, the email newsletter, the Society has Twitter and Facebook accounts and is now on Instagram. And I'm going to say more about the impact of these developments in a minute. A commitment to the higher standards and research, in research and scholarship has always been at the heart of the Society's activities. And this has continued throughout the 10-year period. A number of important volumes have been published and I'd like to extend the Society's thanks to our former publications manager, Kate Owen, for her tireless work in virtually eliminating our publication backlog. Kate's role has now been taken over in an extremely capable fashion by Lavinia Porter. A stated aim of the tercentenary year was to expand the range and value of our research grants. Bequests from fellows since 2007 have enabled the Society to achieve this, and indeed it couldn't have been realised without fellows' support. Grants for conservation and research have risen from 76,000 in 2008 to 111,000 in this last year, and have supported a wide variety of different projects. Over the last year, we've been most fortunate to have been the beneficiary of the wills of Beatrice Ducardi, Marion Archibald, Christine Marnie and John Casey. The gifts made by the two former fellows will support research and library development, while the two latter gifts will make a very welcome contribution to our general fund and will, increase, will support our increasing running costs. Significant bequests have been made over the last 10 years by a number of fellows, including John Evans, John Sainsbury, Margaret Jones, and Drake, John Coles, Corin Bennett, and um, there's a list, as you'll probably know, just outside the door there on our benefactors board. All of these have made an important contribution to the life of the society. We're also very grateful to our fellows Tristan Hilgarth and Edward Harris for their support for our three-year research grant award, first established in 2014. Uh, this allows the recipient to pursue a programme of research through to publication and public presentation. While continuing to promote research and publication, the new era of digital technology has significantly changed the manner in which we now do this. In 2009, the online edition of Antiquaries Journal was launched, followed in 2012 by making the complete journal archive back to 1770 also accessible online. This considerable achievement was, has introduced the society to a new global academic audience, and it's a tribute to the hard work of library staff led by Heather Rowland. This initiative is now being perpetuated through our new publication strategy, and I must extend the society's thanks to our current director, Chris Scull, and his predecessor, John Crichton, for their hard work in preparing this. It's our intention to make all new volumes available on open access. This has now been achieved for the recently published Glastonbury and Sherborne volumes, and it's also our intention to get our entire back series of research report accessible by this means. In the longer term, we intend to have all new reports available through open access to print on demand. And it's good to think that we now have a means of making the important contribution the society makes to scholarship uh, through its publications much more widely available. Research by fellows and others has been facilitated by greater accessibility to the library and collections catalogue. The main finding aids for all printed materials now online. In 2008, the library's holdings were included on COPAC, which gives unified access to the catalogues of some of the largest university and research libraries in the UK. And in 2011, the library's index cards were made accessible online, thanks to the generous bequest from fellow Marion Wilson. The five-year library development plan, launched earlier this year, will now take the library into the 21st century, and through the development of online access to free searchable catalogues, 
and to digital resources will make our remarkable collections accessible to a much wider range of scholars and people who are interested in the past. So I think this brief review makes it clear that the aspirations of the tercentenary year for the society to deliver increased public benefit across its entire range of activities <coughs> provided a significant catalyst for change. While continuing to pursue our core purposes through programmes of conservation research and dissemination, there have been important and beneficial developments in the way in which this is now done. In order to begin to demonstrate the success of the changes which were being introduced, it was decided that in 2008 that the annual report should be transformed from its existing traditional format to become an impact report, providing more quantified information and thereby, and thereby allowing progress to be more accurately recorded. An impact review has become a standard section in the Society's annual review. I hope you've all seen this in the recent mail-out. And comparison of the data over the period since 2007 reveals some interesting trends. Visitor numbers at Kelmscott have risen considerably over the 10 years, partly due to a change in the opening pattern in 2011, but also due to improved promotion and marketing, the more ambitious and varied offer to visitor, to visitors and the hard work of staff and volunteers led by Gavin Williams and Cathy Haslam. In 2008, visitor numbers were around, tw the, 12, 000, around the 12,000 mark, whereas for the last few years, they've averaged around 20,000. Visitor figures for Burlington House and online were not collected in a consistent way until 2013. But in the four years since figures have been kept, Increased public engagement can clearly be seen in a number of key areas, most dramatically in the area of online engagement, which I mentioned earlier. In 1617, the online engagement total was 207,512, as you can see there in the big total halfway down the page on the right. In 1314, the equivalent figure was 13,000. This slide shows in particular the growth in website hits and YouTube views. I better tell you, the, um, the green is website views, um, a new website. That it starts at 2013-14. I don't know how clear it is. It goes up to 2016-17. The new website was launched in um, early 2014, hence the website, the big green at the bottom, uh, only starting the second bar. But you can see the increase um, hits on the website and also, very dramatically, the number of YouTube views, um, which reflect the numbers who now watch lectures online. Our increased online presence owes much to the hard work of our communications manager, René Ladoux, whose enthusiasm for and knowledge of all things digital never fails to impress me. But the impact reports over the years not only show the increasing number of people who we are reaching, they also clearly show that we now have a much more wide and varied audience which is clearly responding with enthusiasm to our work in all its various facets. Before thinking about how we might build on the changes which have taken place in the next 10 years, I think it's worth reflecting on a number of underlying developments in the governance and management of the society, which have been fundamental to allowing these changes to happen. These developments represent considerable achievement in themselves and have allowed us to streamline our administrative practice, enabling us to focus more effectively on the delivery of our charitable purposes. The reform of our charter and statutes, approved in December 2015, has brought the governance of the society into the 21st century, making it compliant with current legislation and best modern practice. Reform has allowed greater flexibility and transparency in and is enabling fellows to become more closely involved with society affairs. You will have seen that a new fellows handbook was circulated with the papers for this meeting, I hope. In all matters governance, I'm enormously indebted to our governance officer, Helen Cockle, whose precision and industry behind the scenes is invaluable. 
day-to-day management of the society has been facilitated by the development of the Strategic Business Plan, which was, interested, was, which was introduced in 2007. At that point, the plan was essentially focused on the definition of strategic objectives. Today, this plan has been refined to include the detailed tasks required to fulfil those objectives, with all tasks now clearly linked to budget allocations. The plans reviewed on a five-year cycle and the introduction of staff timesheets in 2011 has has facilitated both monitoring the plan during its implementation and has provided crucial data for forward planning. This leads me onto the issues of the society's financial affairs and the challenge which they pose. Despite the careful stewardship of successive treasurers, the society has reached the point where the cost of maintaining the building and services at Burlington House, what are termed core costs, are consistently greater than income to a significant degree. As fellows will be aware, recognition of this situation led Council to have to take the difficult decision last year to make savings by restructuring staffing arrangements in the library. Options for increasing income and reducing costs are kept constantly under review and have led to some important (coughs) changes in the way in which we undertake our financial planning. Critically important is the distinction now drawn in annual budget planning between core costs and project costs. As I've already mentioned, the society's income is fully committed to core costs, the costs of maintaining the building and the staffing. And as a result, additional activities, including associated staff costs, In other words, those activities which are defined as projects can only be pursued if they are fully funded from sources external to the society or can be carried out at minimal cost. Recognition of this situation has highlighted just how important the decision to establish the the development office was. We would have been unable to embark on the exhibitions, conservation programmes or indeed our charter and statute reform without external financial support, which the Development Office has brought in. We are very grateful for the dedication of our Head of Development, Dominic Wallace, and his his considerable successes to date. We anticipate operating deficits in the future, I'm afraid, because of continuing low investment returns, increased employers' pension and national insurance contributions, and rising repair and rent costs at Burlington House. And as an aside, I will just say here that the negotiations which will enable us to sign the lease renewal at Burlington House, which was due in 2015, they are unfortunately still ongoing, and there's nothing I can presently add about our continued occupation at Burlington House. All of this means that the general fund which supports our core costs continues to have an underlying deficit. And this is, of course, why, why beco- this is of course is why bequests and donations with unrestricted use are so important to us. The governance and administrative changes I have just outlined do mean, however, that we are able to allocate the resources which we do have at our disposal to very best effect when fulfilling our public benefit requirement. Our present General Secretary, John Lewis, with his background in project management, has made a huge contribution to this aspect of our affairs, and we owe him a considerable debt of gratitude for his persistence in getting the appropriate systems in place. And I'm also very grateful to our Head of Finance and Operations, Katie Drake, and her predecessor, Leslie Favager, for their knowledge and incisiveness in guiding the Society's financial affairs. It's not simply improving systems that makes an organisation successful, of course. It's the people who make it. In our case, the fellowship, the staff and the volunteers at Kelmscott and Burlington House. As acknowledged in 2007, fellows working together make things happen. And since that Making History exhibition in 2007, Fellows have continued to make a critical to play a critical role in delivering our charitable objectives. I've already mentioned the generous financial assistance which fellows have given to our programmes of conservation and research, 
through bequests and donations, and also the vital assistance given with exhibitions and events. Fellows have also given crucial help with fundraising. In autumn 2014, a very successful auction to raise money for Kelmscott was organised by fellows and enabled all the initial planning work which helped us to secure the Heritage Lottery Fund grant. A Kelmscott campaign, campaign committee of fellows has now been formed, bottom right, to fundraise for the main project. In addition, many fellows make an invaluable contribution on council and in the various committees which provide specialist advice to council. This year, four council members are retiring, all of whom have played an important role in promoting the society's affairs. They are Stephanie Moser, John Hines, John Cattell, and our treasurer, Stephen Johnson. All four have been immensely supportive, in particular as members of the policy committee, and I'm especially grateful for the contributions which they've made to this new initiative. I must, however, single out Stephen Johnson for special mention. Not only has he been a most assiduous chair of the policy committee, he's also served the, the society for not just one, but two terms as our treasurer, a role that uh, requires a considerable commitment of time and energy, and which he has filled in an exemplary fashion. And somehow, amidst all of this, he also found the time to provide the lead on our charter and statutory form and bring that to a successful conclusion. We're deeply, effort, we're, we're deeply grateful for the efforts on our behalf, Stephen, and speaking for myself, I know I shall miss your advice and support, which I have personally greatly appreciated. An interesting outcome of the exhibition programme at Burlington House has been the formation of a very loyal group of volunteers who love being here and it seems simply can't wait for the next event to come around. Volunteers continue to play a vital role. In the library, for example, NADFAS volunteers have undertaken a rolling programme of basic conservation over the last 25 years, including completing the rebinding of all the minute books I showed earlier. We simply couldn't run Kelmscott Manor without the volunteers at Kelmscott, top right, and we're remarkably fortunate in having a pool of over 100, many of whom are very knowledgeable about the site and do much to enhance the, in the enjoyment of our visitors. I've already mentioned a number of the staff by name, and every single one deserves special mention. I continue to be so impressed and deeply grateful for the hard work and real commitment shown by all the staff here at Burlington House and at Kelmscott Manor, led so ably by our General Secretary. At events like last year's Summer Lates, with Stephen Papworth at the door, Yola making everyone welcome, not least providing carrot cake, and fellows, volunteers and staff all pull pulling together, it's events like that that really show what we can do when we all work together. So where do we go from here? I hope that I've now given some indication of just how much has been achieved since our tercentenary, under the leadership and guidance of Presidents Jeff Wainwright and Morris Howard, and General Secretaries David Gamester and John Lewis, and promoted by successive groups of trustees on council. In essence, the commitment to, to delivering greater public benefit, supported by the revolution in technology which has taken place over the last 10 years, has allowed us to fulfill our core purposes in new, interesting, and more effective ways. So where do we go from here? While thinking about how we currently approach the delivery of our charitable purposes, two events in recent months have set me thinking. The first was a comment by an eminent fellow who, while observing that the society represents a wide range of interests across the heritage sector, made it clear that he thought this was a weakness. He assumed, that I, uh, he assumed I might add, that I would agree with him, which I didn't. The second was an altogether more positive experience, and that was the Shakespeare fundraising event, which some of you may have come to in January this year. Um, it was held to raise funds for our library development campaign, and we were thrilled that Simon Russell Beale agreed to play a leading role alongside our fellow Morris Howard and musician Jez Smith, seen earlier in a different guise. 
This event showed that the breadth of our interests does in fact represent a considerable strength. At the event, there was very evident appreciation of the fact that the society had brought together leading exponents of literature, art and music, integrating different strands of knowledge to achieve a fuller appreciation and understanding of the past. I think that currently we are overlooking the opportunity to promote this vital aspect of the society. The breadth of knowledge of the heritage sector represented by the fellowship makes us, I think, unique amongst heritage organisations and makes us perfectly placed to speak out as an informed and independent voice in the sector. I should like to see this uh, better acknowledged and celebrated um, and before concluding, I'd like to suggest a couple of ways in which this might be pursued. Firstly, I should like to see the society expand its policy, its public policy work. Over the last 10 years, the society has contributed to, date, uh, to debate on public policy through participating in, group, in groups such as the Archaeology Forum, and by responding to consultation documents by a number of organisation and government departments. Until recently, however, there was no established mechanism for doing this. And the formation of the policy committee, which I mentioned earlier, has changed all that. We now have a statement of our core values, which acts as the reference point for the committee's deliberations. Committee members keep a lookout for issues on which the society might wish to express a view. There is ongoing debate in meetings and by email, and fellows are kept informed of responses made or about to be made through Salon and on the website as here. An impressive number of responses have been made over the course of the 18 months since the committee was set up, and Council has recently confirmed that its work should continue. There are two ways in which this could now be developed. Firstly, it's rightly been observed that responses to date have mainly concerned archaeological issues. We have the perfect opportunity to demonstrate our role as a voice for the wider sector by speaking out on a greater range of issues, and I would now like to see fellows with an interest in other areas of heritage than archaeology participating in the committee's work. And secondly, you'll notice, perhaps, that I've spoken about responses made by the committee. In the longer term, I'd like to see us taking a more proactive role, publishing policy papers which initiate discussion and debate in the sector, rather than simply re reacting to agendas set by others. The second area in which we have the opportunity to, to demonstrate the diversity and strength of the fellowship is Kelmscott. Fellows will be aware that since the last anniversary meeting, we've secured the initial support for a major grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. We have ambitious plans to reinterpret the history and archaeology of Kelmscott and its landscape through the eyes of William Morris as a fellow of this society, exploring the impact Kelmscott had on Morris and how Morris continues to influence us to this day. The project will entail improved interpretation and displays, new activities, including community archaeology projects, as well as major repairs to the listed buildings. The project thus provides the opportunity to demonstrate the importance of the past to a wider public through direct involvement of the fellowship in conservation, research and dissemination. This slide illustrates the framework within which the Society's new vision for, the Cam for Camscott will be delivered and describes a process moving from left to right. The assets in the first column, both in the Society's ownership and that of, the, of others, which relate to Camscott in its widest sense and which we wish to ensure are properly cared for and made accessible. The second defines the three principal periods through Camscott history that we will be exploring. The third key sets out the areas of expertise which exist within the fellowship, something I'm going to return to, and the fourth sets out the proposed means by which the results of the society's research, in the third column, will be communicated to the public. The fifth describes the audience that we intend to reach, inform 
and engage. The pivotal role of the fellowship is clear. History, art, architecture, archaeology and ancient landscapes are the academic disciplines at the heart of our society and they were also an inspiration for Morris at Kelmscott. The society is uniquely positioned to take a multidisciplinary approach to, to research which will allow the potential of the Kelmscott estate to be fully explored. While it is clear that society has an important role in supporting research by way of small grants, as we have been doing in recent years, I believe that we should be exploring the possibility of undertaking programmes of research ourselves, as we have done in the past. This is something which I drew attention to last year, and I was interested to see that in 2007, Jeff Wainwright highlighted the need for us to engage as a society in carefully selected projects. Kelmscott, then, I suggest, would be a good candidate for a society-wide research project over the next few years. The project, once delivered, will do better justice to the significance of the site and more accurately reflect the mission of the society. We will be making it evident at last who owns and runs the manor. For too long, people have visited without realising that the society owns the property. This flyer, promoting both the society's properties on one piece of paper in 2014, may look simple and sensible, but was in fact quite revolutionary. There should no longer be any doubt about why we own and run this remarkable estate. We now, must now make the most of this wonderful opportunity to tell people who we are and to demonstrate the importance of the past to a wider public. So let's make it happen and let's get fundraising in earnest. So, in conclusion, yes, we're facing challenges. We must continue to take every opportunity to improve our financial situation through fundraising and excellent financial management. The basis of our continued occupation here at Burlington House remains uncertain and must be resolved as it's proving a significant constraint on all aspects of forward planning. And you may be assured that every effort is being made to make sure that that is being pursued vigorously. But despite these challenges, there's much to take forward into the next period in the society's life, building on the achievements in public engagement made over the last 10 years. We shall continue with exhibitions, lectures and events with sustained emphasis on engaging the public rather than simply telling them about the past, with the perfect opportunity to pursue this at Kelmscott. We shall continue with our efforts to get as many of our publications online as possible and to make a wider audience aware of the importance of our library and collections. We shall continue to support programmes of research and scholarship of the highest standards. And last, but by no means least, we must celebrate our diversity as a strength and speak out as an authoritative voice in the sector, telling the public about what the society stands for and why the past matters. Would the fellows of 300 years ago recognise the society today? Well, I hope that they would see that we are still pursuing the same goals, the study of antiquity and the history of former times, as it says in our charter. But of course, we now do this in a very different way. Change is inevitable, and we must be ready to adapt if we are to remain relevant to the heritage sector the wider public, and life in the 21st century. It'll be fascinating to see where the next 10 years takes us. Thank you.